Hello everybody and welcome to this October uh, webinar from the eLearning Network. I'm delighted to welcome Luke Merrick from Bolt Learning who's going to deliver our session today on, as you can see, how to use stories to create immersive learning. Uh, now, I will follow up at the end of this with some more updates from the eLearning Network ourselves, but I'm, I'm going to hand straight over to Luke. Luke, if you would like to introduce yourself and then take it away. Thanks very much, Joan. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time to take part in this webinar today. I appreciate your sacrifice of time to come and see what I have to say. Hopefully, you'll all gain something of value from today. So today I'm talking to you guys about how to use stories to create immersive learning. Specifically, I'll be talking about those occasions when a formal learning intervention is required and how to make that that much more engaging and immersive. So firstly, who am I and who are Bolt Learning? Um, so I'm the head of learning at Bolt. So I lead the team that designs and creates these online modules and experiences that help people do their jobs better. And at Bolt, we create bespoke and ready-made digital and blended learning solutions for workplace learning. And we also have a modern LMS, which was recently rated in the top 10 LMSs for user experience in 2018 from elearningindustry.com. And to begin today's webinar, um, I, have, I have to make a confession to you all. It's, I'm a little bit ashamed, it's a little bit embarrassing, but I've, I've just got to put it out there. Avengers Infinity War, the biggest movie of the last, I don't know, 10 months or so, I didn't see it at the cinema. I watched it maybe six weeks ago at home, on the couch, with my wife, on digital rental. I know, it's, it's shocking, really. This one of the biggest blockbusters of the year. It took over $2 billion globally and I didn't even get to watch it on the big screen. However, in my defense, I have three small children and had a baby born in January. So I think that works in my favor slightly. Regardless of that, I really enjoyed the movie. Now I'm not a movie critic or anything, so I'm sure those of you who have better taste in films than myself would have serious issues with it, but I found it lots of fun and really entertaining. And it was one of those movies where there was a few things going on which really stuck with me memory-wise. So I'd really love it if we could, you know, move on with this webinar and you could tell me what is one of your favorite movies? So please type your answers in the chat and let me know what one of your favorite movies is. Gladiator, Die Hard, Miracle on 34th Street, Hot Fuzz. Oh, I love Hot Fuzz. Blade Runner, classic. Oh, there's some excellent movies being listed today. Yeah. And what do you think it is about some of your favorite movies that really makes them stand out for you, that really makes them memorable? Also, answers in the chat, please. So what do you think makes those movies really memorable for you? Emotional connection. Emotional response to characters and plot line. Thanks, Emma. So the storytelling. Yeah, powerful acting and imagery. Yeah, Fabia says a lot of little details that make the difference. Cinematography, oh yeah. Identification with characters. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things which make um, aspects of movies stand out for us and make them really stick in our memories. I think key ones are the story. So often you want to see where the story arc goes. You kind of get hooked into it. What's gonna happen? You just wanna find out. And often there's an identification with the characters. Um, you just want to see what happens to them, how they get out of things, either because you like them and you identify them or because you dislike them and you want to see them get their just desserts. So moving on to a different format, what would be one of your favorite books? Again, answers in the chat, please. Harry Potter, of course. Far From the Maddening Crowd, Shantaram, Kite Runner, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Oh, Christina and Natalie, you are book thief twins. Uh, 
Yeah, Bell Jar. Yeah, I think we all have at least one favorite fiction book which really stands out for us. Now, why do you think it is those books stand out for you? What makes those books stick in your memory, do you think? Yeah, how the characters grow, their development, real story, imagery created by the language, style of writing, jeopardy of wireism, strong narrative, relatable characters. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things which make details and aspects of stories stand out for us. But what I find interesting is that from the favorite movies that we've mentioned, and the favorite books, there's quite a big discrepancy in terms of budget and how they're made. So when we're talking about movies, so say Avengers Infinity War, that had a budget, I think, of over $200 million. But then if you talk about one of your favorite books, um, say Harry Potter books or Shantaram or any of the other ones that you guys have just listed, that's literally just words on a page. All it took was somebody's time to create this entirely new world using words. So what really makes things memorable isn't necessarily about the budget. You don't need hundreds of millions of dollars to make something memorable. Sometimes you just need text on a page. And the reason for that is that stories are inherently powerful in and of themselves. So let me give you an example. My eldest loves dinosaurs. And he, he just knows more about dinosaurs than I ever thought you could know. He knows the names of more dinosaurs. He knows how to pronounce the names of the dinosaurs as well. Not only does he know that there's names, he doesn't mispronounce them. No, no, no. He corrects my pronunciation of the names of dinosaurs. He's like, no, 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 daddy. It's a, it's a dimorphodon. That's how you say it. And he's just managed to absorb all of this information, but he's not studied a list. He's not read a textbook or anything like that. He just watches shows and he reads books, which are all about dinosaurs. And it's these exciting stories with dinosaurs involved. And the fact that that information has been absorbed through a story is testimony to the power of story. So he's learned all this information by reading and watching stories, not by intentionally studying dinosaur names and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of reasons why stories are powerful and why they can and perhaps should be used for learning. Um, I'm just gonna list seven because I think that our, you know, I could go on for hours just listing why stories are powerful for learning, but I've limited myself to seven for the sake of brevity today. So firstly, um, mental framework. So when information is encountered in a story format, we already have the mental framework in place to help our brains to then categorize that information. So effectively, when we encounter information in story format, we recognize it and it's easy for our brain to then transfer information to long-term memory. And the second point is similar, stories organize information sequentially. So we know what to expect from a story. We know there's gonna be a beginning, there's gonna be a middle, there's gonna be an end, there's gonna be something that goes wrong at some point. There's gonna be a protagonist or protagonists, the main character or characters. There's gonna be an enemy or antagonist. So we know what to expect from it. And the fact that we have that mental framework in space in, in our minds, and the fact that the information is organized sequentially makes it much easier for us to then remember it. So that's the first two reasons. Next. As was mentioned for some of the reasons why stories stand out, why movies stand out, why books have been memorable for you guys, a lot of it, it's about the people. It's about identifying with characters that you encounter. It's about seeing how they develop, how they overcome, how they overcome different challenges. Um, stories are about people and people are inherently memorable. Um, we remember information about people all the time. So you think about Karen, your work colleague, she likes certain things, she dislikes certain things. When she's stressed and under pressure, she often reacts like this. So maybe be a little bit careful if she's feeling under pressure. Our brains know how to categorize information about people. 
Next, stories grab our attention more than pure information does. Now, it's my view that the single most important thing you can do at the beginning of a formal learning intervention is to grab the learner's attention. Now, you can have created the single most effective learning intervention in the history of mankind. However, if you don't grab the attention of the learner at the very beginning, what you've prepared, this incredible learning intervention, is never going to fulfill its potential. It's not actually going to be one of the greatest learning interventions of all time, purely because you didn't get the learner's attention. And stories grab our attention far more than just pure information does. Number five, stories provide relevance and meaning to information. And what I mean by that is that rather than simply talking about, say, SMART goals, which most of us are probably familiar with, um, it puts those SMART goals in the context in which they're meant to be used. And that then makes the information far more meaningful. If we get information, I mean, often in training, information is just presented as pure information, stripped of the relevance stripped of any sort of meaningful context, whereas stories provide you with the opportunity to put the information in context. So SMART goals, instead of it just being a concept you need to understand, it's something that you need to be able to use in order to accomplish X, Y, and Z while you're on the job, while you're at work. Okay, the context for SMART goals is that actually you need to help a member of your team to grow in certain aspects of their own skills and you get, need to use SMART goals in order to achieve that. Next, interactive stories can provide a safe space to practice and make mistakes. So I'm talking mainly about scenarios and what scenarios are and role plays are, really, they're really short little interactive stories. And they're really powerful tools that can be used in order to let people learn from experience either in a digital space or in a classroom space so that then you can build up the skill, build up the confidence, build up the motivation to start applying that information, start applying those new skills when they're actually at work in the real world, having made a lot of mistakes online or in the classroom beforehand so that by the time they get to trying to do it on the job, they're much more able to do it in a, in a good way in an effective way. And the seventh reason is, as was mentioned previously, when we were talking about movies and books, stories engage our emotions. We get emotionally engaged in things. We want characters to do well. We want characters to do badly. We want to see how things work out. And the value of engaging emotions in learning is that it engages a different aspect of our memory. So you get semantic memory, which is predominantly about you know, information about things. And then you get episodic memory, which is more about stories, things you've experienced, how you felt about certain events. And now those events may be things that happened to you personally, or they may be events that happened to somebody you're reading about or somebody in a movie you're watching. So when information is presented in a story-like structure, and we're able to engage with characters and engage emotionally with what's going on, it engages both the semantic and then the episodic types of memory that we have, therefore improving uh, recall of that information. So that's a few reasons as to why stories can be used. So let's have a look at a couple of very brief examples that illustrate what I'm talking about. So here I've got some examples of no story being used for information and then a very brief story. So the first one, no story. Here are important insurance procedures to follow. Sounds riveting, doesn't it? With a story that could become, meet Jim, a teenager who was injured in a car accident. This is how his family dealt with the aftermath. Next example. This is what SMART goals are. That's with no story. With a story, it could then become Meet Kim, a new manager struggling to get the best out of, her, out of her underperforming team. Help her overcome their low motivation by setting smart goals. 
And then the final example comes from my history as a high school teacher. Um, for my sins, I was a high school teacher for five or six years in Cape Town, South Africa. And what I taught predominantly at the time was French. And every term, you had to do lots of different types of assessments and lots of different types of practice. So you do listening, you do speaking, you do reading comprehension, and you would do written expression as well. And this was an all boys high school. So I had classrooms of, you know, 30 teenage boys, which presented challenges, as I'm sure you can imagine. And I found that it was quite difficult to get the boys to actually engage with the French speaking exams to get them motivated to really apply themselves and to really do their best. So one term I decided to approach things slightly differently. And that term's topic was describing things in this third person. So for the speaking exam, they needed to describe their friend. So the whole thing of, you know, their hair is like this, il a les yeux bleus, and, you know, he has blue eyes, that sort of thing, describing what they look like and a few adjectives about what they are. So what I did was I changed it to make it more of a story. Now, to give you context, Cape Town is a huge tourist destination. You get millions of visitors from there um, every single year. And there's lots of really great beaches there. So what I did was I made the scenario of the boys were on a beach and they met a group of pretty French girls. And the story was that they had to impress the girls by, doing, by being a wingman to their friends. So they then had to describe their friend in an impressive way to try and impress the French girls on the beach. And let me tell you guys, as soon as the French speaking exam became about that, I cannot tell you how motivated those boys were to do well and to prepare for it well. And it must have been the best set of French speaking exams I had ever come across up until that point. Because the whole story was quite meaningful to them. Um, it put the information in a meaningful context, like I just said. And it was quite realistic too, because it was quite likely that some of them were going to encounter French girls on a beach. And these boys were genuinely motivated to then be able to do something in French to impress these girls on a beach, as only teenage boys can be. So that suddenly made that information more pertinent, more relevant, more memorable. And it, it turned out a few months down the line, I found out that some of the boys had actually come across French people on the beach and had actually tried to do that themselves to varying levels of success, uh, which was quite fun to hear. So they were very satisfied. They came to me bouncing a couple of months later saying, sir, 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 you know that French exam, sir, sir, sir. So that was good. Anyway, so there's a few examples, but let's now move on. Um, We'll talk about a bit, how do you actually do it? So how do you use stories in learning? And then we're gonna pause and you can ask me any questions that you have after that. Um, again, how do I do it? I'm not gonna give you all the reasons because we could be here for hours. I'm just gonna give you a few keys to using storytelling in learning. So which strategies, uh, so basically how do you steal stuff from fiction and then apply it to a formal learning intervention. Firstly, this word's come up quite a bit today. You want to make it relevant to the audience. There's no point coming up with this amazingly creative story about detectives and zombies and robots if it's not gonna resonate with the target audience. So whatever you come up with, whichever story you decide to use, you want it to be relevant. And you also want it to be relevant to the skills that you're wanting people to achieve. So it needs to align with what the performance outcomes are of the project that, project that you're working on. So let's say it's about, you know, it's for sales capability and you're wanting people to be able to um, negotiate a little bit better. Whichever story you come up with, it needs to make sense 
for people to have to negotiate during it because part of learning is that they you need to practice the skills and then you get feedback on that practice so it needs to make sense within the context of the story for the learners to practice negotiation if it's a story about you know um, detectives and robots and zombies and then suddenly you have to negotiate with a shopkeeper that doesn't make any sense and it's quite jarring and it's dissonant which is actually a distraction from learning so it needs to be relevant for the audience and we'll see examples of this a little bit later next learning well this applies to more than just uh, using stories for learning it applies to learning in general it needs to be effortful People learn best when they have to think. There's a lot of talk and marketing about making learning quite easy and accessible. And I think the accessibility is key, but I think if we go towards making learning more frictionless in terms of learner efforts, then we're gonna learn something. The heart of learning is that you have information, you have practice, and then you get feedback on that practice. And then you have this loop that's continuous. I think a lot of learning stops at information. So it just presents information and then the learner doesn't have to use that information anywhere. They don't get to practice applying it to some sort of work related scenario. And then they don't get feedback on that practice. There's just you know 40 slides of information about a certain topic. And then there's a five question quiz that they could probably pass without even looking at the 40 slides sometimes. At, at its very worst, it can be that. But learning does need to be effortful. There needs to be that meaningful practice which can be challenging and then the feedback to it. So there's no point having this amazing story which is an utterly passive experience for the learner where they don't have to think at all. Yes, have an amazing story, but it needs to be interactive. There needs to be uh, meaningful practice in the midst of it as well. Diverse characters. Uh, this came up a little bit earlier as well, having characters that you identify with. So rather than simply having one or two, it's important that you introduce a range of characters. And the value of diverse characters is that while we live in a diverse world, not everybody is a white male. It needs to represent the workforce. Um, it's also important that uh, there's a range of people because everybody's different in the sense that people identify with different individuals. So you want to have realistic types of characters that you use that have their own quirks and that sort of thing. We'll look at an example shortly of that. Um, but then, so when you, when the learner is encountering a character, they think, Oh yeah, well that's that, that person's a bit like me. Well, actually that lady, she's very much like, one of my colleagues or oh yeah, I used to work with a person like that. So having those characters, again, it, it refers back to this whole frame, mental framework idea. We know how to organize information about characters and that helps. So diverse characters. Next, follow the three act structure. So almost all stories that you encounter in any context follow this structure. Uh, there's the setup, the confrontation, and then there's the resolution. So the setup is where you explain what is going on and what the event is that kicks off the journey of the story. So the main character's journey, what, what causes it? So you introduce the characters, you introduce what's going on and the reason for the journey, the reason for the story effectively. And then the confrontation, this is the challenges that the protagonist faces along the way. So it's the battles, it's the difficulties, it's the emotional um, barriers that people come across. And then there's the resolution, uh, which is what happens at the very end. What's the outcome of people overcoming the confrontations or from not overcoming confrontations? What happens then? So you follow that act struct three act structure um, in terms of storytelling too. And we'll be following this three act structure when it comes to an activity that I'm gonna be asking you guys to do at the end of all this in about 10, 15 minutes time. So at the setup, we introduce the characters, we introduce the story, what's going on. The confrontation for learning, typically that looks like different activities and scenarios and role plays. And if you, have, if you wanna have an assessment, then the final assessment can be included as the big final confrontation that people need to overcome. 
And then I think a lot of um, examples I've seen fall a little bit short where you have the story during the module, then there's an assessment. And then, I mean, that's it. There's no resolution to the story. So you don't actually know how things end. It is important that there is a resolution um, because we, we all have that mental framework. We know how stories work. So if there's not a resolution, if there's not, you know, the beginning, middle and the end, it creates a little bit of dissonance and can be a distraction for learning. Whereas actually we want to use storytelling to enhance learning, make it more effective, not less. <clears throat> the fifth how, um, it's important to, to describe how you're going to tell the story in the learning. Are you going to do it from the first person point of view where you address the learner as you? Or are you going to do it from the third person point of view where you know, the learner has to come in and help a third party to overcome certain, ch certain challenges. Now, the uh, first person is useful if you want to make it a really immersive experience. So for a lot of our modules, um, we've been building uh, quite a few ready-made management modules recently. And a lot of them start with the case of you've just taken over a new team and these are the challenges that you face and that you need to overcome. Um, so it's helpful in that way. But the third person is also great, particularly if it's a particularly sensitive subject. So one of the examples we're going to look at a little bit later, you'll see we've made, we made it third person, but that was because we thought making it first person might be a little bit too um, emotionally jarring for individuals. And third person is also helpful because you can then bring in the learner as a helper to a main character that they have to help. So they're more of a guide to help someone through. And obviously as they do that, they learn those things themselves. And if it's first person, you can have a guide who helps the learner to overcome certain challenges. So there's, it's important to decide which approach you're going to take, basically. Okay, so those are some real absolute basics of how you can actually use storytelling in learning. Let's take a pause for some questions. <clears throat> I've got a question, Luke, while we wait for people to put some in the chat function. Have you heard of the term the beat, like in a drama? The where, beat. The beat. It's, I'm going to put a definition in because I've I found one online just now. Um, it's quite interesting. I did some research when I was in the BBC with people who were writing for Casualty, the, the drama program. Mm -hmm. And the beat thing, as you see here, it's, it's, it's like a, a moment of tension in a drama or something. So, and, it, and here in this definition, it says it may alter the way the protagonist pursues his or her goal. But mm. um, it's possibly challenging but for us in e-learning design, but I suppose it's something to think about. I'm a great believer in not giving people the answers and then asking them questions on those same answers. I used to be a French teacher as well. Mm -hmm. And if you take a simple example, like asking people what time it is, you can show them the clock and ask them to repeat in French, il est deux heures, it's two o'clock or something. But if you hide the clock, it becomes a game. And yeah. then they ask you all sorts of questions and just little things like that can just build the tension, build the, build the fun. Anyway, there's some questions coming in there, so I will mute myself again. So we've got one from Ruth here. Is it more beneficial to have shorter, snappier stories or can they cover several sessions or be longer? Um, will they lose their impact if they're too long? Okay, Ruth, I'll answer your first question uh, first, then the second one. So the way we tend to work is that we have short, snappy stories within a solution and then over the top of these, we have like an overarching umbrella narrative, which is going on. And that narrative can cover simply a whole module. So there's a general storyline for a specific module for e-learning. Um, and then there's specific shorter stories in the midst of it, which are scenarios and role plays and, you know, individual activities. Um, but the main arc of narrative that we've also used that over multiple modules before as part of this whole course that we did. So there was a course that we made for a Fortune 500 company um, a year or two ago, and it was for their managers and enabling their managers to have sensitive and informed conversations with the members of their team about 
compensation benefits and that sort of thing. And when all of that is linked to performance, it requires a certain amount of sort of finesse and empathy and sensitivity on the part of the manager. And for that entire course, we had this overarching narrative of, you know, awkward moments and trying to overcome the awkward moments you encounter as a manager when you're asked a question you should be able to answer, but you don't actually know the answer. But then within that, each of the separate modules was a self-contained story in and of itself. Um, I hope that makes sense. And the second question was, will they lose their impact if they're too long? Um, I think the question of too long is a difficult one. It's kind of a case of how long is a piece of string. I would say it's helpful to revisit learning over time. So space practice is an incredibly simple and powerful tool of improving the impact of any sort of training over the course of time. So if it's about a specific topic and you're wanting to reinforce it throughout six months or a year, having the reinforcements, we call them learning boosters at Bolt, um, follow the same theme, continue the same story as the main course or the main solution that was done, that can be helpful. Um, so I guess it's a case of how long is a piece of string effectively used. I don't know how helpful that answer was for you. Okay, let's see some of the other questions. Okay, and we're now halfway through the hour. Thanks for the heads up, Joan. Okay, and from Jessica, a lot of e-learning throws in several scenarios to display several pieces of information. So Terry must buy X, but Lisa wants to find Y, but do you find they wear empathy out um, or are too short to engage? Oh, that's a good question, Jessica. I think empathy can be worn out, but only if it's particularly hard hitting emotional sort of content that goes on for an extended period of time. I think there's, there's that element of it, but then there's another element of learning design in terms of variety. So if the vast majority of a learning experience is just the same type of activity again and again over, you know, whether it's, you know, 20 minutes or longer, if it's just all the same thing, I think that can, that can wear out a learner purely because there's a lack of variety in there. Um, so I don't know how much that answers your question, but I hope you find that helpful. There's a few others I want to get to as well. So from Michael, storytelling can be great if the audience is willing. How do you avoid people feeling patronized? Yeah, more senior colleagues usually expect factual content. Yeah, Michael, I agree with you totally. I think it's, it comes back to being relevant. So the first point on how do you use storytelling and learning, it, it's a case of thinking what would be a relevant learning story for those, for your target audience. So I find more senior colleagues, um, so like the example I spoke about for the Fortune 500 company and its managers wanting to discuss compensation related things with their employees. So they were relatively senior colleagues. They, want, they also wanted factual content, but the, the problem was that the existing training was too much factual content. It was just facts, 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 which was incredibly disengaging. And it didn't influence behavior at all in any way because it was just an information dump. Um, so what we did was we made sure the stories that we used were relevant to the target audience so that when they opened it, they weren't like, oh, what space cowboys, this is irrelevant for me. We, we made sure the story was relevant by starting each of the different elements of the solution with a very realistic challenge. And we knew it was realistic because it was based on challenges, based on stories that we'd gathered from people at the organization. So what sort of challenges do you face around these sorts of questions that employees ask you? So yeah, I agree, you, you need, I agree with you, but I think my conclusion is slightly different. I would say it's not a case of not using stories. It's a case of using, finding out what story are most relevant for that target audience. Um, I'll move on. I'll probably only be able to answer another couple of questions. So we've got time to do 
all the other fun stuff that I've got in mind for you guys today. Okay, so from Sarah, do you think that there are particular types of training that storytelling can be applied to or would it potentially be applied to anything? We do sales training here. I can see it working definitely, but thinking about whether it could or even needs to be applied to technical or product repair training. Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. I think storytelling and learning is really important. It's really valuable. I would say you don't necessarily have to use it all the time. Um, I'm not going to start you know sit here in front of you all and say this is the only way that learning can be done like so many people do because learning is really multifaceted and there's lots of different ways to achieve different things and where a formal intervention learning intervention may be most suitable in one case a simple job aid or performance support document would be most suitable in another um, or maybe some curation would be suitable to accomplish certain other things so i i think there are it, cases where using stories in a formal learning intervention may not be suitable. So if it's technical or product repair training, I would say it depends on the audience a bit. But if you are going to use a story, you just make sure the story is super relevant um, so that it's more a case of very clearly you're demonstrating at the beginning, this learning is going to help you do your job a bit better. It's going to help you out. So make the story relevant to that rather than this different world that you're inviting people into, make it more a case of, as you practice these skills, as you learn these skills, you'll see a character developing on screen with you as well. Um, hope you find that helpful. I'm not gonna get through all these questions. There's more than we have time for. I'll answer one more, then I need to move on. I'm gonna show you guys some examples. <clears throat> and Samantha, is it okay to bring stories from real life experiences or should I aim to find a fictional story for my learners? I think it's up to you. Uh, it can depend on what the real life experience was. It depends on the topic. So if it's something more sensitive such as sexual harassment or something that was particularly emotionally scarring, I would say fictionalized versions are better. Or if it's a case of the person whose story it is, they don't want to be identified from that story then fictionalizing names and locations can be very helpful. But I think some of the most powerful stories are based on real life. So one of the examples that I'm gonna show you shortly is about our sexual harassment uh, training that we put together and all of the different stories that we filmed were based on real life examples. So I think real life experiences can be some of the most powerful ones, but it does depend on what the subject matter is and whether the original person is willing to. Often we fictionalize things in a very minor sense in terms of we change names and locations slightly, but we keep the core of the story because some real life stories can be most powerful. As I've just said, I'm repeating myself. Okay, great. So tons more questions. Sorry, I've got to move on. We will have time for some more questions after looking at the examples and before moving on to the activity. So let's get going. So some e-learning examples. So here's some stuff that we've come up with recently um, that I think illustrates what I'm talking about quite well. So this is the example of the sexual harassment solution that we came up with recently. And our approach here was that we wanted it to be from a third person perspective and we created this module where there's multiple short stories. So it begins with multiple different situations where the learner has to answer the question, is this sexual harassment? And some of them, it's very clear cut, like it's obviously sexual harassment. Other ones, not so much. And all of them were based on personal experiences that people have had. And these were all filmed and then we turned them into an interactive video um, to get people to think about it. Whereas, I mean, typically it would, people would just be given a definition for sexual harassment at the beginning of training and expected to remember it. We decided to make it a little bit more immersive by creating this whole experience out of it and asking people to think about it for themselves before obviously clarifying and expanding on whatever answers that they, that they provide. <clears throat> So as we go through these different examples of sexual harassment, we then pick up one story and then we explore it in quite a lot of detail. So we look at the consequences for the perpetrator of the sexual harassment 
we see what the impact was on him professionally, personally, um, and otherwise. And then we look at what the impact was upon the recipient of the sexual harassment. And then we look at what can you actually do? So what if you're a recipient of it? What if you're a bystander? What do you do if you observe this? What can you do? So it was a combination of these real life stories, which were fictionalized in this instance, um, but then mixed with really practical support and guidance on, okay, what can you actually do about this if it happens to you, as well as for this one, what to do if you're a witness. This is applying um, some information that's just been delivered to them about what to do if you're a witness, basically. Um, so all of that, you know, learning is information plus practice plus feedback, including all of that plus this ongoing story that we have going on. And you'll notice this isn't this isn't all gamey or cartoony or anything like that at all. This is very practical. It's quite a hard hitting solution that we have here because we thought that would be what would be most relevant to the audience and for this subject matter. The next example is rather different. So here, this um, <clears throat> is an example taken from some training that we did uh, to support first line managers who have not necessarily done any training before on this topic. And uh, this was themed on the A-team. So this one is a bit more cartoony. It's a little bit more fun <clears throat> in the subject matter. And you'll see this is a first person one. You've just been brought in to take over a team in urgent need of good management. So we started with the story, but also we start with a, with a challenge as well. So the user, the learner is presented with a challenge that they need to overcome by learning different things and then applying those learnings to different um, confrontations, to different challenges that we place before them. And this is a great example of some diverse characters that we created, diverse and realistic characters. So we ripped off the A-team, I'm not gonna hide, we totally ripped off the A-team, but we call them the Z-team because they are the worst team. But each of the people does have potential. So we have Yowling Bad Burdock instead of Howling Mad Murdoch. If you've never watched the A-team before, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. So I would suggest after this session, Google the A-team and educate yourself about that. And then we have Beardman Peck instead of Faceman Peck. And then we have uh, Miss T, who plays the role of you know, the B.A. Baracus character who is a badass who loves uh, Lapsang Sushan tea, effectively. So a little bit fun and a little bit quirky. Um, and quirkiness tends to make characters a bit more realistic. Um, so we all know someone who's a little bit style obsessed. We all know someone who has a slightly obscure obsession, whether it's tea or coffee or something else. And then this is an example of a very, one of the very basic uh, scenarios that we have uh, where this is applying uh, some coaching and mentoring principles, uh, like a coaching and mentoring toolbox. And now people are given realistic situations that they need to apply them to. So I really want to improve my skills so I'm more effective out in the field. What should I do? And up until this point, what people have been you know, informed of is that it's important that you ask questions. You don't just give answers if you're using a coaching leadership style. So then the answer here would be, what do you think you should do? and get the, you know, get the member of the team to be thinking about it. And then here we have an example of how we pitched the final assessment. So this one has an assessment at the end, but instead of it just being an assessment which is unrelated to everything and breaking the spell of the story, as it were, uh, we included it as part of the story. Um, so we themed it as not just an, okay, well, that's the story, now do an assessment because you're supposed to. And we themed it as the, the Z team's big mission is tomorrow, but there are some last minute issues you need to resolve to make sure your team are fully prepared. And these issues are all um, contextual questions. So it's different members of your team with different challenges that you need to solve um, by applying what's been learned up until this point. That's a few examples. And I realize I'm in a very privileged position because I work at a vendor 
Um, my job is to create these solutions. We have a team of graphic designers who are really, really good at their, their jobs. I've got a team of people who work with me who design solutions as well. And that's a luxury not many people have. I'm sure a lot of you do not have your own graphic designer you can call upon and you have to source um, images yourself. But it's not all about the budget. You can, like a very simple step that can be taken is to change questions so that they're mini stories or scenarios. So the question, what does SMART stand for? Could become, Imran needs to improve his sales figures. Which goal below is the smartest? And then you'd have a series of different goals, some of which are smart, some of which are not, and so on. So it can, you, in the most basic sense, you can just change the way you ask questions to incorporate aspects of story to give context and meaning to the information. <clears throat> And then, like the example I just showed you, you can theme assessments so that they relate to a broader narrative. And often that's simply a case of giving people a couple of sentences which make this mental image, which create this world in their minds. And it's based purely on words. Just think about books. You don't need fancy graphics or big budgets to create these incredible detailed worlds. Sometimes you just need well-written words. And then final point on that, flashy graphics can help, but they're the icing on the cake. Questions? What do you guys want to know or clarify? Look, it's John again. Just given that we haven't got a huge amount of time, shall we move these questions to the end and then you can carry yes. on your task? Yes, I think that's probably a good move. We'll save the questions to the end, otherwise we'll run out of time to, for you guys to actually give it a go for yourselves. Um, so, for the next part, I'm going to ask you guys to give this a go yourselves. So you're going to get the opportunity to try it out. Um, so, I want you guys to create stories for courses using the setup confrontation resolution framework. So on this slide, I'll give you an example of what what I mean by this. So um, I've created three different activities based on different sectors. So there's one for sales, one for retail, and one for leadership training. So you can pick whichever one of those you, you prefer. And you're gonna get a link to a Google document, which you can then edit, and which gives you a scenario. So what you need to do is to read the scenario, and then in one row of the table that I've provided in each document, you just need to write down your ideas of what the learning story could be for that specific scenario. So here's an example, and I'll show you what I've come up with. So then you have an idea of what, what you need to do for this. So firstly, create a story for this course. Jazz works in procurement for a major supplier in the FMCG sector. If you don't know, that's fast moving consumer goods. There's been a recent problem with employees not following good procurement practices. After conducting work with a consultant, Jazz has identified that part of the solution needs to involve training staff to follow a new and improved process. Jazz sees this as a serious topic, so wants it to be very practical and relevant to employees. So no zombies in this one. Um, I've mentioned zombies a few times. We have used zombies before, but in relevant and meaningful ways. So use the setup confrontation resolution framework to create a learning story um, for this project. So here's an example of how it could be done. Setup. The user is introduced, we tend to refer to learners as users most frequently. Um, the user is introduced to some sad and dejected employees who were recently made redundant. Um, the employer recently received a huge fine for breaching procurement practices and in addition to a loss of income as a result of reputational damage, this caused them to cut costs. <gasps> Fortunately, the user can go back in time and right some procurement wrongs. So they're given the opportunity to go and um, make things right. So the confrontation, a handful of smaller challenges along the way as the user must help the two original characters navigate tricky situations. So if you introduce characters at the beginning, it's good to reuse them later for coherence. Final confrontation would involve the user helping them to apply what has been learned while navigating a high pressure situation that's under a lot of scrutiny. And then the resolution would be if successful, the user is informed that they've averted disaster and saved the jobs of the two employees. Cool, so guys, now it's your turn. 
there are three scenarios to choose from. Scenario one, sales capability, retail and leadership. And Joan, could you share those links um, in the chat so that people can follow them, please? Um, so all you need to do is choose one of those and then link to the document and then have a go. Um, I'll give you guys about five to 10 minutes. Well, it'll probably be closer to five minutes because it's 10 to now. Um, after a set amount of time, I'll pick out one or two examples from each scenario and give you guys some feedback. Um, and following that, we'll wrap things up. And if there's time, we'll have some final questions. If you want help, type your question in the chat. If you want to chat with me further after this, then you can get in touch with me with luke.merrick at boltlearning.com. And there I see Joan has posted them. So you'll see scenario one, sales capability, scenario two, retail, scenario three, leadership. So click on the one that you think would be most relevant for you and have a go yourself. Great, I'm gonna stop sharing now and Joan's going to uh, share from her screen so that I can have a look at the progress and see how you guys are doing. And remember, if you want help, just type a question in the chat. All right, just give me two ticks and I'll share the, my version of the PowerPoint. Can you get into Google Docs now? Okay, look. Uh, yes, I can. People may need a bit of time to think about it. Michael's put in an interesting question about relating storytelling to technical software training. Have you got any experience of that? Um, technical software training. Let me have a look at the question from Michael. I think in terms of technical software training, I think it's, I would, normally I would ask questions around what the, what the need is for the training. So why is the training there? What's the context for it in real life? And then you can have a, have kind of a fictionalized version of that as part of the solution. So you have a fictional character and you could have it so that the um, learner then has to aid this fictional character in overcoming certain things by mastering certain skills, or you can make it more first person if you like, um, where there's a less detailed story where it's simply a case of um, immersing the learner in a story straight away and just giving them a task and making it more like a game with a time limit. So I suggested to people that they want to look at these links later um, yeah they can save them because obviously the chat will disappear when we shut the webinar down do you want to just double check if people are actually filling it in now because if they want to do it later then we might as well just move on and, and yeah draw the just having a quick look now Yeah, we've got a few people having a go at scenario one. Okay, yeah, so someone in scenario two is having a go. A couple of people in scenario three having a go at it. So for scenario two, we have the setup. This is with Ruth and Ramesh working in HR departments. The chain implemented an upselling initiative last year, but haven't seen much impact. Employees still aren't upselling. Um, part of the, so some 
They did some research into it and discovered that part of the problem is employees didn't know how to upsell and see it as a negative thing customers dislike. So one of the examples we've got here is that the setup is a mother and child are in a shop and only buy a couple of items. They don't seem like they have a lot of money and the mother looks stressed and wants to leave the shop as soon as possible. That's a compelling setup. Have you got any leadership comments for scenario three? Yep, I'm having a look at the scenario three. Yeah, so we have one here. The characters include two managers, Jack and Sarah, with two different management styles. Each has a team of three employees. Yeah, that's a great way to start. So with that one, you could then make it a case of the learner then has to aid Jack and Sarah to um, better manage those team in, you know, by applying uh, coaching skills uh, in a practical way. Then anonymous, someone labeled as anonymous wombats in the Google documents is talking about manager of a dev team for a games development company. And then another scenario in scenario two is someone's talking about introducing an employee who's being pressurized by their store manager to sell more and boost profit. And the user has to coach the employee on how to upsell to a number of customers in a game style scenario. I like that one. It's nice and practical and meaningful um, for the target audience and based on that scenario that I've given for, with Ruth and Ramesh. And then for the mother and child one, we've got some confrontation and resolution there. Nobody wants to do the sales one today. <laughs> Great, bye Samantha, bye Kenny. Thanks for joining us. So we've got a couple of minutes left before we yep running over. Shall I stop sharing and hand back to you? Yeah, sure. Play with me a moment. I've just launched the evaluation poll because we're nearing the end of the session. Yes, great. Okay, great. Well, um, thanks everybody for participating. We are near the end now. So if anybody has any questions about what we've looked at today, um, then please type them quickly. Um, and again, if you want to get in touch with me and you want to chat some more about storytelling and learning, you can get in touch with me, uh, Luke at luke.merrick at boltlearning.com. I'll be very happy to chat with you about what it can look like, how it can work, and that sort of thing. Kevin's done a nice little plug, thanking us, but also encouraging people to vote for me again in the elections that are upcoming. So, hey, thanks. Can I take control back now, Luke, and just run through a couple of things uh, with the Absolutely. website? Absolutely, you're welcome. So, share my screen. So just very quickly, um, there will be a recording of this and you'll get an email with the URL, but we do actually have this YouTube channel, uh, which you can sign up to and you can see all the recordings for various stuff that we've done already. And then uh, this is the website. If you haven't been there recently, this is the sub site for the Connect conference, uh, which is on the 15th of November and tickets are selling out. So don't leave it too late to book yours. If you're interested, uh, there is the opportunity to nominate yourself to stand as an ELN director. And there are nomination forms available now. Uh, we'll be promoting that shortly. 
and obviously if you're a paid up member or an industry partner then you get to vote as well but if you're just an associate member you don't have the opportunity to vote and if you're not already aware of it we've got um, a linkedin group which now has over 4000 members 4413 at the last count and anybody in that group can post up to the community um, we no longer pre-moderate we're not allowed to do that now but we do keep an eye on what's published so that it's not too salesy but again if you've got anything coming up then you're, you can share it on there and, and if anybody's interested as a member in setting up a local meetup then that's something we can do too and we can help you with that so i think uh, that's about it really uh, let me just finish off by saying thanks again luke for your time today and everybody who's joined us and uh, have a look at the poll if if you can see that and there's there isn't at the moment there isn't a webinar scheduled for november but there is one in early december and we'll start promoting that shortly um, but otherwise that's it so thanks again luke thanks everybody and i'll stop the meeting now yeah. thanks everyone for your time